Hello and welcome to Jews on Fire. My name is Baruch Ruman and I'm very glad to get to speak to uh, you guys today. So I want to share a little bit about me and my background. I grew up 15 minutes southeast of Houston in a little town called League City, uh, right down the street from the Johnson Space Center, uh, the Kennedy Space Center, sorry, yeah, the Johnson Space Center in, in Houston. And growing up, uh, my experience was uh, middle class suburbia and a wonderful uh, family environment. Uh, I grew up going to shul uh, maybe like once a month uh, with Rosh Hashanah services and Yom Kippur services and even public menorah lightings. And, uh, and I knew that I was Jewish and I knew that I had a proud heritage, but I didn't really know uh, it deeper than those experiences. Until I was 13 years old and I found myself craving to have a bar mitzvah. I didn't know why, but I knew that it's what I wanted. I saw, I had seen other people have them. And by the time I turned 13, I said, I need one too. And I begged and pleaded with my parents to put me into Hebrew school. And in about a year and a half, I was able to have a bar mitzvah and lane from the Torah, uh, um, Portia's Kitetze. Uh, and in that time, uh, my, the, the, uh, the message that was relayed to me was that a bar mitzvah is like the culmination of life besides getting married and having children, like that's all I could do in Judaism. But I didn't really buy that. And so I pushed and I wanted to be more part of the Jewish community. And eventually I found myself teaching uh, pre-K and kindergarten in the local Sunday school. And I absolutely loved it. And by the time I was 18 years old, I said, okay, well, you know, this is great that I have this Judaism. Now it's time to take this and to go on to college. However, um, life had different plans for me. When I was 18 years old, I had a very rare virus that um, about 100 people in the United States get every year. This virus is a strain of the mumps that attacks the heart, and it's unfortunately not covered by the mumps vaccine. There's about 14% of mumps cases that are not covered by the mumps vaccine, and this is one of them. This virus that I had gotten um, eats the heart muscle until the heart is so weak that it cannot continue to pump because of the damage to the heart and the fluid buildup around it. Long story short, when I was going to Texas Tech University, just before my first day of college, I was standing in a super target, looking at the DVD section, looking for a movie to see that night. And it was right then when I started to feel all of the symptoms of having a heart attack. However, I knew that because I was 18, there's no way that I could be actually having a heart attack. So I went to the pharmacy counter and I asked the, the pharmacist for help, to which the response I got was, I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do for you. And when I heard those words, I blacked out and I hit the floor. The next thing I know, there's a super target attendant standing over me going, sir, sir, are you all right? I open my eyes and I tell him, get me an ambulance. I'm not going to die in a super target. I didn't know it at the time, but my body did. My body knew what it was going through and it knew that it was shutting down. And that time I was rushed to the emergency room and I'm sitting in the emergency room not knowing what's going on and I'm calling for my parents and I hear the doctor saying over and over again, check his blood levels again, he's 18 years old, there's no way this kid's having a heart attack. Check it again, check it again. And long story short, this virus caused um, the symptoms of a heart attack, unfortunately not just one heart attack, but about 10 times over what a normal heart attack is. And by two in the morning, I found myself sitting in a hospital room with the doctor on the phone with my father, telling him that he doesn't think that I'm going to make it through the night. Now, clearly I'm sitting here in front of you and telling this story. So I did make it through the night. The next morning, my mother was flown from Houston to Lubbock, Texas, where Texas Tech University is located. And she was there with me bedside. And it was on the third day, two days later, that I start to feel I'm having a second episode of this a virus induced heart attack. How did I know it was coming on again? Well, I had it the first time and therefore I remembered all the symptoms and I was able to call it out. So I push the nurse's button and the nurse comes into the room with the doctor and, the, and they ask me, well, what's going on? And I tell them I'm about to have another heart attack. I don't know what you can do for me. And so they start looking at my vitals. They start looking at what I've got, I've been given and what I can be given. And, and in a single moment, my mother is sitting there holding my hand and all of a sudden I feel my entire body shutting down. It feels like someone held the power button on a computer and, and, and it was so long that the computer was forced to be shut down. And in that one moment when I felt that happen, 
I had a knee-jerk reaction. I had an automatic reaction. And my reaction was to say, I hereby forgive anyone who ever did anything wrong to me. And I ask for forgiveness for anyone I ever did anything wrong to. Now, up to this point in my life, I have to say, I wasn't necessarily um, believing that God is a reality or that I have a relationship with God. Or I also didn't believe that the Torah was a reality or that the things in the Torah were necessarily true. I had been taught that the Torah was like a guidebook for life, a nice instruction booklet, but not necessarily was everything in the Torah real. And that was my experience up until that point in time, until I said these words. When I said, I hereby forgive anyone who ever did anything wrong to me, and then I, and then I asked for forgiveness for anyone I ever did anything wrong to, at that exact moment, when I said those words, I heard from above me call out a voice that said, you're forgiven. And in that one moment, I found myself standing opposite my body, looking at myself on the table, looking at the doctor and the nurse move around me, seeing my mother holding my hand next to me, the clock ticking on the wall, people in the hallway walking past, and I go over to my mother and I tell her I love you and goodbye. Then in my mind's eye, I go to my father and to my sisters who were still in Houston at the time, and I go to them and I tell them I love you and goodbye. And at that time, immediately I'm back in the hospital, I look up and I see this big white swirling fire above me and it's pulling me upwards and it pulls me through the hospital ceiling and I look down and I see myself go through one ceiling and another ceiling and another ceiling and all of a sudden I see the top of the hospital getting smaller. I see the town of Lubbock getting smaller. I see Texas, the United States and the earth getting smaller. I look around me and in every direction there's nothing but stars, planets, galaxies, the most beautiful scene that no telescope picture could do justice to. Being in a spot, looking at the universe, I said to myself and to this elevator of light, I said, stop right here, I wanna stay right here. And the elevator of light said, nope, we're gonna continue going up. And the elevator of light kept pulling me up and up and up until we passed all the stars and all of the galaxies in the entire universe. And we came to a place where there was nothing but abounding darkness. In every direction, you couldn't see anything, and everything was cold and dark, and it was, in a very real sense, it was scary. And I told the elevator, I don't want to stay here. Get me out of here. And the elevator said, great, because we're going to continue going up and up and up, until the elevator came to a place that was pure light, light in every direction. There was no single source of light. It was warm. It was nice. And I wanted to stay there. And I told the elevator, drop me off here. And the elevator said, nope, we're going up one more level. And the elevator kept going up and up and up until I came to a place where light and dark are the exact same thing. And there's no difference between the two of them. Now, many people have asked me, what does that look like? Light and dark being the exact same thing. And the only way I can describe it physically is to say, imagine that you're in a pitch black room and you can't see your hands in front of your face. Now turn the lights on and you can see everything in the room. You can see your hands, you can see everything. Go back to the lights being turned off and the room is pitch black, but now you can still see everything. The darkness doesn't stop you from seeing things. In fact, the darkness aids you to see things in the same way light would. Sounds strange? Well, it is because it can't be expressed physically. But nevertheless, this is where I found myself immediately. As soon as the elevator stopped, my immediate reaction was to say, hands, where are my hands? And I look here, no hands. I look down, I'm like, feet, where are my feet? No feet. I go like this to touch my body, no body. I don't feel a body. I look around and in every direction, I see nothing and no one for infinitely. My eyes and the power of sight don't stop. And I'm looking around in every direction, thinking to myself, wait a moment, I've been here before. And it hasn't been so long since I've been in this place. It felt as though I was in this place just before I was born. And like my life that I had lived those 18 years was like the snap of a finger. And as I found myself sitting in this place, I looked out and I recognized my father. I recognized my creator. I was in the presence of Hashem. And in that one moment, I called out to God. And I said to myself, I, I, I felt as though God was my father telling me, son, I, you know, I need to speak with you. Come have a conversation with me. And as soon as I did, I opened my mouth, so to speak. And I said the words in English. I, I asked, is this my time to leave? Am I done with my life? And immediately, as soon as I asked this question on the opposite end, 
I received an answer in Hebrew, lo, lamed aleph, no. Now at the time, and even now, I still don't speak Hebrew, and I didn't speak Hebrew then. However, I did know five Hebrew words. I, know, I knew ken, lo, ani, shalom, and my Hebrew name, which is Yonatan. So after hearing the word lo, I knew that the word meant no. And in a single, a single moment, I saw the, the letters spoken in front of me, painted in light. If you've ever seen the Northern Lights, and if you haven't seen the Northern Lights, Google them, it looked like these letters had white Northern Lights breaking through them. The letter Lamed and the letter Aleph, and they were standing there in front of me. Now, speech, sight, smell, touch, they were all the same sense. All my senses were one. And so when I heard the word low, I also saw it. Now in this one moment, this word low uh, came to me and the word low said, it came to my right hand and it said, here's the life you lived. And it showed me my life in a video on a golden scale. And to the left of the scale was the beginning of my life and to the right was the end. And I saw at every moment, my thoughts, speech and action, how my, how, my, how my thought, speech and action were being weighed on this scale of good versus not good of good thoughts, speech, and action versus not good thoughts, speech, and action. And this movie was like a thriller because I didn't know how it was going to end. But thank God at the end of the movie, I saw that the scale of good weighed more than the scale of not so good. And it was very difficult and painful to see the things that I had done even one time in my life of not treating another human being with kindness, respect, and dignity. And in that one moment, as soon as the video to my right finished, the word low came to my left hand and it told me, here's the life you could have lived. And again, it showed me a video from the worst possible life I could have lived to the best possible life I could have lived and every possibility in between. Again, on a golden scale that was weighed all good and all not so good. And when I saw this, people ask me, well, how can you see everything at once? I'm a finite human. I can't even remember everything I saw. The way I describe it is imagine that you're in a cubicle room with mirrors are with mirrors on all the walls and mirrors on the ceiling and the floor. What happens when you have two mirrors side by side like this? The image gets reflected by all the mirrors going on. However, you can't see forever and so you can only see as far as your eye will let you see. Now imagine that the power of sight doesn't stop and you can see infinitely in all directions. Now imagine that the, every wall, the ceiling and the floor all have doors and every door is a decision. So now you are all of these people in every room and every decision you're making all at once. And this is how I saw in physical terms, this movie played of my life as I could have lived it to my left. As soon as this movie finished, the two movies flew to either, uh, to either side of me, seemingly to one extreme and the other extreme, where one extreme was the life I had lived. And it was like a, it was like a game of, of sports of some kind. Like the team on one side was the life I lived and the team on the other side was the life I could have lived. And the two of them were going back and forth and I was the ball being kicked around from one side to the other. On one side I saw, here's the things that I did that were not so good. And then here's how I could have done them instead. And here's the things that I did that were good and here's how I could have done them in a not so good way. So it was to both sides. However, even one moment of a time when I did something that was not so good and I saw what I was supposed to do brought tremendous embarrassment in front of my father in heaven to tell him, here's what I did and here's what I could have done. That experience of, of, ex of expressing exactly what I did, why I did it and how I did it was the most embarrassing and painful experience I have ever had in my entire life. It was like my whole being was red, was glowing red with embarrassment. And I was almost crying in front of Hashem asking, what now? What can I do now that I have this truth in front of me? And Hashem consoled me by telling me they're there. And he rolled out in front of me a Torah scroll. Now this Torah scroll didn't look like a regular Torah scroll that I had seen before. It did, however, the scroll itself was a white parchment in white fire, and the letters were laid out in letters of black fire. And each letter I read from the bet, from the bet of Bereshit, from the very beginning of the Torah, to the Lamed of Israel, the very last letter of the Torah, and everything in between. Now, I had never read the Torah in full in my entire life. 
Yet somehow my soul had read the Torah and my soul knew how to read the Torah then. And even though I did not understand what I was reading, I saw this Torah being read in front of me by myself. As soon as I finished reading the Torah, it came up in front of me and it said, I am the Torah, do you accept me? And immediately I said, absolutely, yes, I accept you, Torah. And the Torah came in front of me and it wrapped itself around me like a garment, like a talis, and it gave me a big hug. And in the back of the Torah, the beginning of the Torah wedged itself into the end of the Torah and they made a circle around me. Now, when the, end, when the beginning of the Torah wedged itself into the end, and the end ended up wedging itself into the beginning, I saw that as the end of the Torah wedged itself into the beginning, that the last letter Lamed came together with the first letter Bet, and they made the word Lev. Now, this word Hebrew word Lev, I did not yet know, but this Hebrew word Lev, I would soon come to find out, actually translates as heart. And in this word heart, Hashem was showing me in the first and last letter of the Torah that He was going to heal my heart from having had a heart attack, from having had this virus eat away at my heart. He was going to restore my life to me and He was going to give me back the rest of my life. And in that word lave, just like in the, in the word low, I saw my life as I lived it and could have lived it. Then in the word lave, I saw the rest of my life as I can live it. And again, I was made to see a movie with golden scales being weighed of the best possible life I can live in the future all the way to the worst possible life I could live in the future and every possibility in between. I saw myself that there was the potential that I could be taken at any day and that Hashem could say your time is done. And Hashem then gave me a contract. As soon as all of this experience had come to a close, as soon as I had finished seeing it and I accepted all the things that were laid out in front of me and as soon as I finished watching the movie of the rest of my life as it can be I asked now what and Hashem immediately took this entire experience and wrote it up as a contract in front of me and there were five points to this contract the five point contract said it started out you me are going back to your life you're being given another chance to live another day and here's the five points I'm asking of you point number one you have to study Torah. You have to learn my Torah. Hashem told me, God told me, I wrote myself into the Torah and I want you to know me through it. Point number two, you have to do my mitzvahs, my commandments that I command you in my Torah, in my Bible. Whether you understand them or not, I am asking of you to join and to partner with me in a relationship, in a marriage through my commandments and I will wed you through my commandments. Point number three, I'm not allowed, Hashem tells me, God tells me, I am not allowed to keep Torah and mitzvahs to myself. That the, that the Torah that I learn and the commandments that I do should actually be for other people. Meaning, I have to teach another person Torah. I have to help another person perform a mitzvah. Even if that means foregoing my own Torah learning, even if that means foregoing my own mitzvah because of the love of another person. Point number four, I'm not allowed to keep this story to myself. Yes, God told me, even at this time when I didn't understand anything, He told me, eventually you will come to understand this experience and I am charging you to share this experience with other people. It sounds a little crazy, but when you go and look at other people's near-death experiences, almost each and every one is told this same point, this point number four, that they have to share what they saw. Point number five on the five-point contract, the very last point, Hashem told me with the Hebrew word lev, the Hebrew word heart, that I have to use my mind, I have to use my intellect to rule over my emotions. I'm not allowed to live a life where my emotions rule supreme and I act out of anger, frustration, annoyance, sadness, depression, before letting my mind be the one to guide those emotions. I'm not allowed to live a life emotionally based, I have to live a life emotionally based with intellect, intellect ruling my emotions. And in that way, I will live a full life. God basically told me, you might think going back that it's the food that sustains you or the air that you breathe that keeps you alive. And he told me rather, it's the Torah you learn, the mitzvahs you do, the people you help, this, the fact that you share this experience and you being in control of your emotions, that's what's going to give you a long life. And in one moment, I saw a signature line come up on the bottom and God told me, 
you have a single moment to sign. If you do not sign as soon as you can, I am taking this whole experience away from you and you're coming with me. And in that one moment, I jumped to put my hand to the signature as fast as I could. And as soon as I did, Hashem told me, look down. I looked down. God told me, open your eyes. I opened my eyes and I found myself back in my body faster than I went up. I had been put back down. Now, as you might be able to imagine, I, coming from the background that I explained to you, a uh, background growing up where Judaism and God and Torah are not a reality, and rather it's a very nice idea, but it nevertheless, it's just an idea. And over here, God was giving me this experience that no, God is a reality. Torah is an experience. The mitzvahs, the commandments that we are asked to do are a trueness of the nature of our lives and it is how we live. And in this, I was fighting back and forth, back and forth in my mind. Is God real or is God not real? Was this experience a true experience or was it not a true experience? And I tried actually to run away from it because I was in so much shock that I had gone through this experience. Now, I had only one problem when I tried to run away from it. And my one problem was that every night I had a reoccurring dream that I relived the entire experience in full from beginning to end. And every day when I woke up, it felt like I was falling asleep as if waking up in this body was some kind of dream. And Hashem and God and Torah and his commandments are the true reality. And I went back and forth this way for about six months, for about 180 days, I ran away from the experience and I said I didn't want any part of it. However, after six months, I said to myself, it cannot be so healthy of me to deny this experience and to push myself away from my own life. And therefore, I said, I'm going to accept that it's possible that both my life that I'm living here and the experience I had over there, that they're both real. And as soon as I accepted that, I stopped having the reoccurring dream. Now, to this day, I have investigated in my Judaism. I have gone deeping deep and searched into what the Torah has to say. And I have been at each moment blown away to find out that, for example, in the last por in the last Torah portion, um, the part of the, the Torah says that the Torah was given in Eish Das, in the fire of knowledge. And Rashi, the foremost Hebrew, uh, commentator on the Torah, says on those words that the Torah was given in fire in times of old, meaning before the world was created, the Torah was written black fire letters on white fire parchment. I can't make that up. That's something I came to discover after this whole experience. And it's something that even though I don't understand why Hashem showed me what he showed me, and even though I don't understand the Torah that I learned, and even though I don't understand the commandments that God is asking me to perform, there's one thing that I do understand. And that is that there is a God, that there is a relationship to be had, that there is a reality beyond me, beyond myself, and it is called the soul. And that soul craves and needs to invest itself in that relationship. Just like we don't get to choose our family, I don't get to choose and we don't get to choose our relationship with God. In fact, God chose us for it. And that is something that we can all be very happy and excited about. So I want to finish off by saying that a person doesn't have to go through a near-death experience to recognize and realize that every day is a new opportunity to engage in our relationship with God, to engage in our relationship with, with our loved ones, because those two things are the exact same. The people in our lives, our work, the way God leads us, our challenges and struggles are all a part of our relationship with God. And this is my message that Hashem, that God is asking me to come and share with you. And that is invest in your soul, invest in yourself, speak to a rabbi, reach out to someone you love and tell them how much they mean to you. And I promise you, you won't be disappointed. Thank you so much for listening to what I had to say. And I wish you a very blessed afternoon.